I was hoping that uh, this part of the tonight's program is not going to be recorded. I apologize for starting late. I have no excuses. It wasn't weather or computer or anything like this. Um, I am to be blamed. I was late. Um, uh, but my name is Ali Mirsapasi. I teach here at NYU and let me welcome you all, those of you who are here in person and others who have joined us on Zoom uh, to, uh, to this evening's um, um, event on behalf of my colleagues at Iranian Studies Initiative and also Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern um, Studies. Let me also make one announcement before I introduce our two speakers and um, uh, make a couple of comments about uh, tonight's uh, event. Our next and, uh, and last event uh, will be in two weeks on April 18th. Same place and same time, April 18th at five o'clock in the afternoon. And we, we, we have another uh, um, book talk, a, um, a new book by our colleague, Professor Firuze Karshani Sabet at University of Pennsylvania. The title of the book is um, from Heroes to Hostages. I have actually already read the book. It's a wonderful book and a different book that looks at the history of Iran-US relationship. Uh, I hope you can all join us um, in two weeks. Uh, <clears throat> but tonight, <laughs> As much as I am late and I feel um, feel um, sorry about this, we ha I ha we have two uh, wonderful colleagues and friends who are joining us to speak about their new book, um, "How Sanctions Work: Iran and the Impact of uh, Economic Warfare." The book. Um, was just published in 2024 by uh, Stanford University Press, a great press. I, I had a great experience with them, and I know that Nargis published an earlier book by them, which I will mention in a second. The book has four authors. Uh, it must be the most wonderful book that has, it's not an edited volume, it's written by Agree. Um, Vali Nasr, Jawad Salahi Esfahani, and Ali Waiz. Uh, the last board on, on the topic. And as I said, published by University, Stanford University Press this year. Um, let me um, introduce the speakers very briefly so that I would be out of your this space and I have our colleagues um, discussing the book. Our first speaker is um, Professor uh, Nargis Bajogli, who is, um, both of our speakers are very accomplished scholar and public figures and artists and filmmakers. Um, um, again, uh, I should be blamed for this. I will give you a short <laughs> um, version of their um, accomplishments so that we have enough time for their presentations and your discussion. Nargis received her a PhD from um, New York University. Nargis was actually a member of Iranian Studies Initiative for many years. 
and has been in various events that we have organized. Sometimes she has kindly actually organized even after she graduated for us, um, other times as a panelist. Um, Nargis is assistant professor at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. In fact, both of our speakers are from the same uh, program. Um, Nargis was also trained as a documentary filmmaker at NYU's program, Culture and Media, Media Program, and also Teach School. Um, she is also author of a, a wonderful award-winning book, Iran Reframe, Anxieties of Power in the Islamic Republic. Although I want to be brief, brief I have to say this because it's a sort of, um, we, pl we planned a celebration of Nargis's book and discussion for, I believe, March of 2020. And you know what happened in March of 2020. Uh, we had to cancel all of our events. At the time, we didn't know what Zoom was. <laughs> uh, well, at least I didn't know what Zoom <laughs> was. And because we couldn't have in-person events, that, that um, semester, we canceled all, all of um, our, our event. Uh, the book has been celebrated um, uh, in, in many ways. And um, I have also... Um, um, uh, been lucky enough to, to read the book and uh, hopefully in the future we will find some forum to have uh, to discuss uh, that book in New York. I don't think the, the, uh, the your, your first book was ever uh, discussed in New York City. Th that book was also published by Stanford University Press in 2019, I believe. Nargis is currently writing a book on impact of chemical war in, during the Iran-Iraq war. I have to mention that, um, that, that Nargis uh, made a documentary film about this topic that we have shown it here and uh, look forward to your new book. Our um, second speaker is Professor Vali Nasr, um, a um, Majid Khadouri Professor of, of um, International Affairs and Middle Eastern Studies at John Hopkins uh, University School of Advanced International um, Studies. By the way, in Washington, D.C., I should say that. Um, Professor Nast received his PhD from MIT in political science in um, 1991. Very important year, but I will not tell you why I think it is very important year. Um, he served as the eighth dean of the John Hopkins um, SAIS School of um, Advanced International Studies from 2012 to 2019, rather long time, and served as the senior advisor to US Spatial Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, uh, between um, 2009 and 2011. A scholar, and writer, but also a practitioner of political science, which many of us do not dare to even go close to. Uh, Professor Nast has written many, many books. I just um, uh, shared with you a sample of some of his work. Um, um, he has written a book called The Dispensable Nation, American foreign policy in retreat, uh, the rise of new uh, middle class and how it will change our world. <laughs> this is everybody's hope, <laughs> at least in Iran, it hasn't happened. Um, 
the Shia revival, how conflict within Islam will shape uh, the future. It has already shaped I think, the present. Um, Democracy in Iran, um, uh, a wonderful book that I have read and used. I believe co-author with Ali Faisal, our, our colleague in California. Uh, history and quest for liberty. And the last one that I mentioned, although she has, uh, he has many other publications. Uh, well, that, that was the last one. Um, just for your information, uh, each of our speakers will talk about 20, 25 minutes. And um, now this will start first, and then Vali. Uh, if any of you, since it's the same book, I imagine um, um, there may not be any, you may not want to make comments about each other's uh, presentation, but if you want to do, please go ahead and make comments. Otherwise, we open it for you, those of you who are here in person, to make comments or to ask questions. For those of you who have joined us virtually on Zoom, um, please write your questions um, on the chat room and our colleagues at Kevorkian Center will read those questions. Um, again, thank you so much. So thank wonderful you. to have you here to, to, to kindly agree to make That's the fine. travel and be with us and look forward to your talk. Great. Thank you so much, um, Adi, for that very kind introduction. Is that echo always? It's on the TV. Oh, maybe the TV volume can go down. I did. I was hearing it. Yeah. Um, OK, so as that gets fixed, you'll hear me double for a second. Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone for being here, both hybrid and in person. Um, yeah, I think we can. There we go. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be back at NYU. It's wonderful to be in New York. It's wonderful to be here amongst you all. Um, and I really appreciate Ali and Arang and the ISI, and the Iranian Studies Initiative, and Kivo. Um, I have so many good memories here, so I, I am, um, it's lovely to be here. Okay, so we will not, I will not speak for 25 minutes. I am of the TikTok generation, well, fairly, so I will be shorter. But I hope that means I can get the, the basic things and the most important things from the book uh, to you all. Um, so what I, um, I'm going to sort of set out some of the bigger picture of this book and how we came to it. Um, so sanctions have been used um, and implemented uh, over 900, or the increase of sanctions since the beginning of the 21st century has been 900% um, by the United States. So the US has uh, implemented sanctions pretty much nonstop over the past 24 years. Um, on uh, countries all around the world and increasingly on larger and larger economies. Uh, the study of sanctions tends to be from the perspective of international relations scholars, um, from the perspective of policymakers, and from the perspective of, of the economists, and at times public health scholars. But very, besides the public health scholars and some economists, there's very little attention paid to what the long long-term impacts of sanctions are on a targeted society. Oftentimes the conversation is about how sanctions could be tweaked a certain way to make them work in, in whatever society is being targeted. So in 2019, along with um, Vali, we started a, an initiative at um, the at SICE, where we are, Johns Hopkins, uh, called Iran Under Sanctions. What we wanted to do was at the time, Iran was the most sanctioned country in the world. Um, and it was also a country that has been under four decades of sanctions. So it was in many ways a perfect case study. Uh, hi, welcome. Um, it was a perfect case study for us to be able to study um, and to look at sanctions. So the book focuses on Iran, but the book really is uh, taking a larger look at how sanctions itself works. 
right? And part of what we did for um, the, the initiative that we, we had is we invited over a dozen scholars of different disciplines around the world, uh, scholars um, to look at the different impacts of sanctions on Iran, whether in different parts of the economy, the environment from various social scientists. And then onto that, we added close to 90 long form oral history interviews, discourse analysis of um, of what sanctions policymakers themselves write and say, discourse analysis of Western English news and discourse analysis of Persian uh, language media. And so we try to put together this, this as much as possible comprehensive view of what sanctions do. Now, the reason that this was, that we went about it this way is that oftentimes the question is asked, do sanctions work? And we thought that, that as, that's actually not the right question to ask because with a country with the size of the economy and power that the United States has around the world, of course, sanctions work. They do work in the world just like any other kind of social and political phenomenon. But what we wanted to look at was what is it that sanctions are doing and how can we track that over the long term? Um, so there was a, um, an, a concerted effort made on our part to also take the concept of sanctions, which is written by lawyers and bankers sitting behind desks in the, in the Department of Treasury or, or uh, uh, agencies like it in the Western world, and we wanted to bring it down to the human level. We wanted to understand what is it that sanctions do on an everyday basis to people in society. And of course, just like any other social phenomenon, they impact people differently depending on where they are in, in the social strata of a given society. So we wanted to look at it from the perspective of those who are tied into the uh, Revolutionary Guard and the political elite, as well as those who are single mothers, those who are activists and very involved in the civil society, pushing for change within Iran. And what we found in Iran, um, and uh, we are doing this work on other countries now outside of Iran, and we're finding very similar, very similar trends. And what we find are a few things. The first is that um, sanctions, uh, they are meant to be an alternative for war. They are meant to cause certain kinds of behavioral change, whether by putting enough pressure on the targeted society to rise up for change or putting enough pressure on the targeted political establishment so that they buckle under sanctions essentially and, and are willing to concede. But instead, in reality, what do sanctions policies show us over the long term? The first is that sanctions have entrenched the political and military elite uh, in the targeted society, and I'll go into why in a second. The second is that it has increased securitization um, because this targeted state views economic sanctions as economic warfare, uh, and it also entails other forms of coercive um, experiences, which I'll get into in a second. And the last is that it weakens the population um, because it uh, adversely impacts, especially those in the middle classes and obviously those who are already working class and the poor. Um, and in the, while it is putting more and more pressure on uh, everyday people, it is entrenching and uh, solidifying sort of the wealth and the political power of those who are tied into the military and political elites. So why, why do these things happen? The first is that um, sanctions, um, when they are implemented on quote unquote rogue states like Iran is, uh, it's not like that political establishment is gonna put their hands up in the air and say, okay, our bad, let us, let us do whatever you want us to do. That's not what these states will do. Instead, they will figure out ways to bust through sanctions. So busting through sanctions means that they have to engage in trade on the international market that is uh, illegal to trade in that way. So the prices of things that they have to pay for, the ways in which they have to engage in that trade, the price goes up. It, it is much riskier for uh, uh, companies and banks outside of Iran to trade with Iran. There's a lot of corruption therefore that happens because bribing needs to happen. Trade goes off of legal uh, markets and into the black and gray market. Uh, so in that, in that process of sanctions busting, those that uh, within a country like Iran and every other sanctioned country that 
control the borders, which are the militaries. Uh, they are the ones who control the flow of things in and out of the country and are also the ones who can, uh, who really are at the forefront of um, receiving the kickbacks and the bribes that need to happen in order for these goods to come in and out of the country. So there is an entire process that we've trained, traced out where we see that all of this money that is being flown, that is being transacted on the black and gray markets then needs to be washed when it comes into the internal markets. So this is why you see actually in countries like Iran that have relatively large economies, uh, you have seen under maximum pressure sanctions, which is what the Trump administration has put on and the Biden administration has continued, you have actually seen huge increases in the in rises of luxury malls, luxury cars, luxury apartment buildings, because it has created a whole, uh, it has solidified and made the uh, those who are tied to the military and political elites, the capitalist classes of society, the wealth owning classes of society, and they need to wash this money when it comes in. And so that washing of that money happens through the cultural sectors primarily, especially the film sex sector, the visual arts sector, fine arts, music, um, and those end up having long-term impacts, which I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. Um, uh, second is that sanctions are a form of shadow war. So they are not just economic warfare, but they are also, especially under things, uh, countries that are under the comprehensive sanctions like Iran, they are also um, intelligence warfare first and foremost. So there's covert operations involved. There are um, uh, 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 cyber warfare, media warfare, psychological warfare, and as we see throughout the Middle East, uh, warfare that spills over into neighboring countries across the region. Um, why is that? Because uh, sanctions, especially maximum pressure sanctions, are meant to um, uh, uh, or are being viewed from the Iranian state as an existential threat, and they are being carried out from multiple levels um, uh, in, in this shadow war mentality. So part of what we look at and we trace out is how this shadow war uh, plays, um, sorry, excuse me, how the shadow war is fought by uh, the intel arms of the military establishments. So this is why over time we see that the Quds Force, which is Iran's extraterritorial um, Revolutionary Guards force in the region, as well as the intel arms of the Revolutionary Guard come to occupy key decision-making power within Iran be and begin to harden the political culture because since they see themselves as under multiple forms of warfare, they then need to securitize the political, uh, the political sphere, and they do so by pushing out the opponents of, uh, uh, the, by pushing out their opponents who are the ones who have wanted uh, engagement and diplomacy with the West, right? And so we see over time uh, the, that those who are tied to these intelligence apparatuses within the Islamic Republic get more and more decision-making power within the country. Um, and uh, in doing so, they are also going back to sanctions busting, the ones who are controlling the trade in and out. And so they are building what in Iran they call the resistance economy, which are infrastructures of trade towards new um, uh, um, terrains that bypass the US dollar or that are not susceptible to be um, uh, uh, sanctionable in essence. So they are trading with neighboring countries. They are trading now increasingly with Russia um, and they are building as more and more countries come under these kinds of sanctions, they are building infrastructure. For example, Russia and China are now en engaged in multiple forms of building tech, uh, um, transportation networks, for example, across the Eurasian uh, territories uh, to be able to do trade that goes against uh, and, and that avoids the US dollar. Um, and then the third thing that we look at is the discursive war that, um, that accompany sanctions. So sanctions are just pieces of paper, right? It's, and so they need to be, at, they, they, you need to be able to make a country so radioactive that banks and that companies do not even want to go near that country. So there is an attendant discursive war that takes place um, in which that country is made to be a pariah on the international sphere. Uh, sanctions policymakers in Washington are very clear about how, for example, they went about doing this in the case of Iran. And, and if you 
are looking at it, it, similar things are happening with Russia. So what does that mean in reality? Is that sanctions become increasingly, they are extremely sticky. It is very difficult to lift sanctions off because it is not like you can say that now uh, a country that you have spent four decades making a complete pariah on the international sphere, it will necessitate policymakers and or politicians to put cap political capital on the line to say that Iran is now no longer uh, you know, this incre incredibly evil country, and so we can begin to, to trade with them. Now, when, when we do have a period in time when that happens after the signing of the JCPOA, we'll see what happens, and Badi will talk about that. Um, so because of this, the stickiness to the sanctions means that other countries like Russia and China have been paying attention to this, and they understand that when you go under U.S. sanctions, it is incredibly difficult to get off of U.S. sanctions. And so it makes logical sense then to build a, a infrastructures of trade to uh, bypass and have the acknowledgement that you will not be able to uh, be an unsanctioned country anymore. And actually within Iran, they study the Serbian case very closely for this, and Badi will go into that a little bit more. So this is sort of the, the bigger picture of what it is that we're looking at in, in our book, and, um, and then I'll pass it off to Badi now. Thank you, sir. If, uh, if you don't mind, um, I want to just uh, I make like a statement that there are uh, 10, 12 copies of the book, our friends and book on the table out there. Um, uh, if, if you would like to have a copy, uh, just go ahead. If you have time, we can monitor. If not, just take the book. I'm sure our uh, speaker would be happy to. Well, that, that's a fantastic deal. <laughs> you you do that, you're going to fill up this place much more. You know, they solve the hybrid problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, well, let me start by thanking Ali and Arang and, and the Kevorkian Center for inviting us. It's really wonderful being here and to be part of this uh, program. Uh, and also to be able to talk about this, this uh, topic. So uh, I'll build on what Nargis laid out, which is really the core arguments of the book. I mean, first of all, I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, as Ali hinted to it, it's, a bit, it's, an, it's an odd book in, in the sense that uh, it's not a massive, uh, 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 you know, tome. It's a, it's a, we del deliberately made it a, a, a thinner book written for a broader audience because the point was really to get this out and, and to get it to a broader cross-section of people who need to... Uh, uh, here are the core arguments, uh, although they are built on a lot of social science research that has been has been done over time. Uh, uh, you know, the four of us came to this from very different methodologies. Uh, Nargis is an anthropologist. One of our colleagues, Javad Salih Asfahani, is an economist. Ali Baez has a PhD in nuclear physics, but is also is a policymaker, and, and I'm a political scientist. And, and the people who actually we relied on, the, on whose research we relied on, you know, came from even more diverse backgrounds, from arts and architecture, education, healthcare, et cetera, who had looked at these sets of issues in Iran. Uh, I mean, editorially, and I have to give all the credit to, to Nargis, uh, you know, she, she, she worked with all of us in a way that the book read as seamlessly as possible, despite our different methodological and, and writing, uh, um, uh, you know, s uh, style. So I hope uh, you, you, would, you would find that, that it's worked, but if you, if you like it, you know, the kudos goes to, to, to Nargis. Uh, you know, uh, Nargis sort of la laid the core argument in the sense of uh, uh, the fact that, as we said, you know, sanctions work as a scalpel works. It does cut. But, uh, you know, there is increasingly the case of Iran shows that there's this discrepancy between the idea of uh, you know what the sanctions are supposed to do and and what they are doing, and really the the sort of the sh short message of the book is sanctions are not working, right? They they are actually not working. Uh, I mean, if you look at all the reasons that the United States has put sanctions on Iran, which is change the regime, ch or change the regime's behavior, uh, or to uh, uh, you know make it a compromise on the nuclear issue, to make it to be more dating and open and uh, and uh, moderate with its own population, if you looked at all of the matrices, it's actually gone the opposite way, right? In fact, it has gone in the opposite way in a far more accelerated way 
in tandem with increasing sanctions. It's almost like it's a causal relationship between when maximum pressure sanctions was imposed on Iran, with the fact that Iran went from smaller nuclear program to now enriching, uh, you know, 60%, 90% enrichment being li literally weeks away from having enough fissile material for one bomb, to being far more hardline uh, with its own population, to effective consolidation of power, not just under conservatives, but the most sort of hardline part of the conservatives, and the country essentially being de facto run by the Revolutionary Guards. And its regional behavior has not become less if the Gaza war, or if you want to, at least in many people, in, in the very people who advocate sanctions, in their view, Iran is responsible for the Gaza war in, in many large ways and small ways. And so even if you took that, their own words at face value, so you know what has uh, sanctions accomplished? In fact, Iran has become more powerful regionally and more aggressive regionally. Right, the United, Iran before 2018 would not launch missiles on American bases. It would not openly kill American servicemen in this sort of brazen way that it did uh, in, in in Jordan. So, so in a way, that actually sanctions have been counterproductive. And as Nagy said, you know, sanctions have a long history. The United States is now using them in as sort of first choice foreign policy tool across the board, without literally thinking about whether it's worked or not. And Iran is, 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 is an important case. It's a large enough country. It's the country that has been sanctioned most in terms of length of time it's been under sanctions. And also it has been under most amount of sanctions. And until Russia invaded Ukraine, it was the most sanctioned country in the world. So it provides a lot of data for you to actually look at these set, sets of things. And this effort that we started at uh, uh, the Iran initiative of having social scientists of various kinds look at this is actually really to look at sanctions that uh, beyond just the political discussion of about attitudes of uh, Iran and whether, uh, whether sanctions are good or bad and to really look at what it does. And we sort of avoided this idea whether the Islamic Republic is good or bad. I mean, this is not the point of the book, uh, whether it should have nuclear weapons or not, or whether it should do this or that. Let's take those who, who favor sanctions and deploy it. Let's take them at their own, at their own word that uh, this is the worst regime ever. This is, it, it, this is you know, the worst thing happened. You have to deal with it. But then the key question becomes that, you know, as I said, whether, whether what the, the policy of choice has been actually helpful and, and has it worked or, or hasn't it worked. One of the key issues that Nargis mentioned is that actually sanctions, uh, and I put it in a different language than hers as a political scientist, sanctions is the political economy of Iran. I mean, when, in, when in political science we talk about a country's political economy, you know, how does it develop? How, what is the institutional map of, of, a, of a country connecting state to society to economy to its various branches, balance of power between various institutions? Sanctions, in effect, has basically formatted Iranian state over time. I mean, the key relation, economic relationships are decided by sanctions. I mean, as Nagy says, you know, once you are in a black market economy, once you rely on particular forces, once your supply chain is in this way, once your method of production is in this way, then that basically becomes the fundamental structure on which the country's politics, distribution of power, and economic power is, is set up. Iran is far less explained by the ideology of revolution today or by the hostage crisis or by many things that happen than it is actually explained by sanctions. In particular, the Iran of today, I mean, you, you may say that, uh, uh, that the, the ascendance of the conservatives in Iran would have been, uh, you know, uh, would have been unavoidable, but, but we cannot do counterfactual history here that had, had the United States not left JCPOA, whether you know, President Raisi would be president in Iran or not. We cannot do that. But what we can say is the other way around, that there is a very drastic shift in Iran's, the nature of Iran's private sector. There's a very drastic shift in the industrial relations in Iran. There's a very drastic shift in the win, way in which uh, a trade works in Iran and the distribution of power within Iranian political establishment that is connected to these economic changes and to the securitization and everything else that goes with it. So, so in a way, you have to even look at sanctions as, as a social science causal factor. The way we look, used to look at 
particular kinds of trade. We used to like particular kinds of colonial relations, you know, like, uh, particular kinds of interventions in the market, whether it was done by colonial powers, other powers, governments, et cetera, that they basically shape, shape the, the, the system. Now, our book is not sort of a definitive answer to this. In fact, if anything, what we've tried to do both in the initiative and in the book is actually to start both the academic and the broader public discussion about sanctions. I mean, our hope is that many more young PhD students will pick this up and begin to look into the data and to the relationships, the way in which that they have done the same thing with political economic relations in Africa, Latin America, Asia, about why certain states develop in, in, in certain ways. And I think it's, uh, you know, to policymakers uh, and those who favor sanctions, they never look at it essentially as a political economic factor. Uh, and, and so, uh, so I think that's a very key issue that we want people to come away with. It. In, in other words, the, the deep ways in which uh, uh, sanctions has actually shaped the Iranian state. It also has shaped its behavior and outlook on the world, largely because as, as uh, Nargis uh, mentioned, that and, and if, if we look at particularly Iran's foreign policy decision making, you know, uh, uh, very closely looking at its discursive language, looking at its actions that is taken, that sanction that that, the, that sanctions is very different from actual war, in many ways, because actual war there, there is there is a there is a reciprocal decision that is made by both sides to start shooting, and there's a reciprocal decision that taken by both sides to 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 stop shooting. With sanctions, it doesn't work that way, right? In other words, as, as Nargis said, uh, uh, a, a country like Iran can agree to stop uh, uh, its nuclear program in accordance to what it signed. I'm not saying, not, not in a sort of a hyperbolic way of saying, you know, they should, the deal should have been better. I mean, that's a whole different argument. But, but the deal that they signed, they can actually implement that. But what actually, again, the case of Iran showed is that sanctions don't go away. Because sanctions are laws, and laws are political by nature. The process by which you implement laws and rescind laws, even the, our, our own laws, uh, uh, is, is, is not si similar to using, using force, right? So even rescinding a law in the United States is very difficult. It has a process that involves legislature, public opinion, uh, politicians calculating their political uh, you know, cost, et cetera. And that actually also applies to sanctions. So in fact, the, the, the lesson of uh, uh, JCPOA, and we sort of show this in the book, many people argue that it was Obama's sanctions that brought Iran to the negotiating table in 2013. But if you sort of open the aperture further and looked at the issue of sanctions in Iran in a longer duration, you would say that whether Iran signed the deal or not, sanctions never left, right? Because, because yes, Iran at one point in time responded to sanctions, came to the table, even if you, again, take it at face value of those people who say this. But even under Obama, no more than 20% of the sanctions were ever lifted. Either they couldn't be lifted or wouldn't be lifted or took too long to get lifted. Already criticism within Iran had started about the fact that the U.S. was dragging its feet on sanctions, right? And then the sanctions were reimposed and many more were added to it. So in effect, the sanctions regime was never, never gone. Doesn't matter what the country does. So the lesson of Iran, in a sense, is that sanctions are permanent. Sometimes they're permanent by intention. In fact, Iran, as Narga said, points to the case of Serbia, where even after Milosevic was gone, even after Serbia became democratic, the sanctions were not lifted because there's no compulsion on the United States to actually observe a ceasefire, right? Uh, and, uh, and in the case of Iran is that, and, and, and if Russians are looking at the Iranian case, if the Chinese are looking at the Iranian case, they would basically say, once you go down this path, there is no coming back, right? So then the calculation of the country as, as, as uh, Nargis said, one is to do sanctions busting and survival, which in the case of Iran has become the idea of resistance, more of a mat, resistance economy, et cetera. But resistance economy is also a form of political economy. I mean, the longer you do it, the more you actually, it will become uh, your system. But also it, it, it gives, uh, as the case of Iran shows, 
it gives the, um, the, the incentive for the country to actually dig in further in order to dig out. Let me tell you, let me, again, the example of Iran, as we say in the book, is, is very clear. So in year 2006, Iran had 120 centrifuges. Its program was, had just started. Uh, three European foreign ministers went to Iran and signed a deal with Iran that Iran would give up these centrifuges and not build any more and not enrich uranium in exchange for lifting of sanctions. The United States said, we're not interested in a deal. You just have to go to zero, everything, et cetera, right? And no sanctions lifted. You just have to do it. So the conclusion Iran made is that there is no cost to the United States to sanctioning Iran. The cost is on Iran's side. So you're not going to get U.S.'s attention unless you raise the cost to the United States, right? You have to go to the table with something. And in order to get U.S.'s attention and bring it to the table, you have to have a much, much larger program. So yes, in Washington, the assumption was that Obama's additional sanctions brought Iran to the table. The assumption in Iran was that the fact that by 2013, Iran had 120,000 centrifuges brought the United States to the table. And then after the US withdrew from the deal, the assumption in Iran was that they, it was their mistake to go to the table with 120,000. They should have gone to the table with a lot more, right? So Iran, every stage when you look at the case of Iran, the, the conclusion they make is that you get under sanctions by doing something bad. But by not doing that, the sanctions don't go away. The only way sanctions go away is to, if for you to behave even worse. Right? Because that then will bring you to the table. The second example is when President Biden became president. His conclusion was maximum pressure is working. Leave it there. We will go back to the deal when Iran goes back to the deal and does everything, and, and then we decide whether we want to come back to the deal or not, right? So the Iranians said, fine, we'll go to 60% enrichment. Immediately, the United States said, okay, we're going to come to Vienna and talk to you, right? So, so, so essentially, the way the sanctions are implemented, the fact that they are not removable, the fact that it's too easy for the United States to impose them, and too difficult for the United States to rescind them, makes, makes basically locks in the country in, in the very behavior that brought it there. And in fact, it gives it incentive to keep going down that path. The scarier it becomes, the more the United is likely that it actually will negotiate on sanctions. And then to this, you add the fact that, you know, when you go to war, the president of the United States declares war. Right, the, the the Congress has to provide, uh, uh, you know, the, the the war. But the United, but the Congress of the United States cannot declare war on its own, nor can it say when the president says stop shooting, the 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 Congress cannot say no. We're going to continue the war. We're going to actually vote to continue the war. With sanctions, they do. The 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 Congress of the United States is perfectly capable of imposing its own sanctions. Like uh, one of the famous sanctions, the Iran-Libya Act, which was done under President Clinton's time, was not done by the executive branch. It was done by Congress. I mean, just a week ago, Senator Menendez, in the middle of all of his tr troubles, decided that it's time for three new sanctions uh, um, legislations against Iran. Right? This is not coming out of the White House. There's nothing new. It's coming out of Congress. Right? And that Congress has the ability, if the president says, I want to lift these sanctions to say, no, we're going to either pass legislation to continue them, or we're going to prevent you from doing that, or that the president has to give a, has to, uh, give a political cost to, to doing so. Uh, and the political, the discursive side of this is quite significant. It's much easier for, for the president to say that we're going to stop shooting in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Right? Because there are actually American soldiers fighting, their life is on the line. There are no American soldiers in sanctions. It's a piece of paper. Right? And, and, and therefore, uh, 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 there is no public support for uh, lifting of sanctions. In fact, it's the opposite. When you sanctions, let's say, a central bank of a country, be it Iran central bank or Russian central bank or Syrian central bank, but the case of Iran is very instructive, 
You're basically saying they're sanctions because they're a terrorist entity or they violated the law. Now, to remove those sanctions requires any congressman or the president of the United States to stand up and say, I vouchsafe that the Central Bank of Iran or Central Bank of Russia has never, ever, ever touched anything that is illegal, right? And no American president would do that, right? Because in reality, that's not the case. You, you actually arrive at a ceasefire in a war with an enemy, not after the enemy has been completely transformed into an angel, which is the, which is the bar that, that the, the, the demonization now requires uh, politically. And finally, I think the case of Iran, and particularly after JCPOA, showed that you know, sanctions, as I said, for the United States is a piece of paper. There's no cost to imposing it. There's no cost to removing it, especially with Iran, where there are no American businesses that did, did business with Iran. There's no reliance on Iranian exports. There was no blowback uh, business-wise with, economically with the United States. So there's no cost. But with, in negotiations, the other country, Iran, actually has to give up something that is tangible, that has taken time and money, like a plutonium plant, centrifuges, entire infrastructure of, of, of nuclear technology, which at any rate, it took him 10 years to build, it took him billions of dollars to build, and it's not an even exchange in a sense, particularly because it takes nothing for the United States to put those laws back in place, but Iran is gonna take another 10 years, 15 years just to get back to, to where it was. So, so the, the lesson also we see with Iran is becomes that, that, that even in dealing with the United States, you should not give it all up, right? You, you, you know, that, that, that sanctions can only now resolve things partially because they're not capable of resolving things completely. Because there, there is, in the eyes of the other side, there is no, there is no protection from sanctions. So, and I close with this, when, when, when Iran and the United States came very close to signing a deal in Vienna in August of, uh, I think, 20, I want to say 2021, 2023. In the end, the deal fell apart because the, what the Iranians were asking were saying, will the United States guarantee that it will not reimpose sanctions? And the US said, we can't give such a guarantee because you know, there'll be another president and they can always reimpose sanctions, right? They asked the, and then they also asked whether President Biden would guarantee that at the end of his own term, he wouldn't reimpose sanctions and he wouldn't even get, give that guarantee, right? So if you cannot get a guarantee that sanctions don't come back, your assumptions that sanctions never really actually leave. So the best negotiations you will do with the United States is always partial, right? If, if it's partial on their side, it should be partial on our side, which I will only partially behave. Like whatever is you're asking for. I will only partially behave on regional issues. I will only partially behave on, on nuclear issues. And I will partially behave on human rights issues domestic. Right? And so in a way, again, you know, what, what, sanctions, can, what sanctions achieve in the end is, is basically actually freezing the intended country into exactly the kind of behavior and in a, in, in, that, that, that it... Uh, uh, supposedly wanted to do away with. And the longer they stay, because of the reformatting of a country's political economy, it, it actually creates embedded institutional structures that are then not movable. I mean, between 2018 and today, Iran's economy has transformed in such fundamental ways that it's not possible even to snap back to 2018. I mean, Iran's private sector, as, as, as Naga said, has been completely changed. Independent private sector is gone. So you now basically have a crony private sector is, that is attached to the black market and to the IRGC. It has a vested interest in the current system. And, it's, and, and, and therefore, you know, the, uh, the, the entire situation of Iran now actually does have a social base. I mean, reading of protests in Iran is one way of looking and saying the regime has no support. At, at one level, that's absolutely true. But at another level, institutionally, now it's embedded in, in the very state structures that basically is connected to Iran's political economy that is that, that, that essentially the sanctions regime uh, created. And I'll, I'll stop. Thank you so much.
So we, we started this long before the book came out. So. <laughs> This is mainly based on Welsh research and the very articles that you listen to. Um, I think you can make good sense the way that more is more. So, at the class level, there is this argument that that's an are awful, have all these problems that they are causing a more, a better alternative than uh, not just arguing a case that you are, you argue that uh, oh. that um, sanctions of a kind of war because of the consequences. But you are, you, your argument is more radical, that, or at least the impression I have is that sanctions are even worse than wars. Um, um, which is interesting because I remember in the 80s in New York, um, there were all these demonstrations pro South African freedom demonstrations asking US government to put sanctions on South Africa. Um, because it seems somehow painless. It's not like saying intervene military in South Africa that would pressure on, on a government. Uh, so the first question is that, is this really what you are arguing? That sanctions are worse than wars? Well, uh, I mean, there's a level at which which Nargis has to answer is the socially. I would say, first of all, I, I think the South Africa example has to be put in a context. One is that in every case, even in the social sciences, you always do have an anomaly. There's always a case in which a, a particular country may, may uh, just like a, any government, may work in a different way. Uh, but also, you have to realize that South Africa under apartheid actually had two economies. And uh, we were sanctioning the white economy, in effect. And uh, because of the way that that country was bifurcated, it was uh, 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 it was very easy to say that we are sanctioning uh, the, um, the, uh, the the white South Africans, but we're not really sanctioning the black black South Africans whom we actually want to empower. This is almost a crude parallel to saying like people who support uh, you know sanctioning Israel, right? They don't. If you said that the Palestinians and Israelis are one economy. Then you would think about it differently because you were saying that I'm actually sanctioning uh, the very people that I'm supposedly helping, right? So I don't think South Africa is same as Iran or same as Russia because, and I would add to this, there is a moral hazard in, in, in sanctions, which we don't think about. You, you, you say you sanction governments, but you don't sanction governments. You sanction the people. You put your, you put your knee on their neck and you say, I'm going to squeeze until you scratch and overthrow your government, or you scratch your government enough until your government changes its behavior, right? And you're correct. It's cheap for us because we're not sending soldiers there, right? It's very easy to say it's an alternative to war, but war for whom? You know, it's an alternative to war for us sitting here, no conscription, no soldiers. It's not necessarily an alternative to war for people who are there. Are the Iranian people today, and you probably have better experience than this than I, uh, uh, in your studies, are they any, is it any different from what they were going through during the Iran-Iraq war with shortages, with varieties of things, right? I'm not talking about sending their kids to the front, but in reality, the kind of economic hardship they're going through is very, in, in some ways, is reminiscent of the, of the 1980s. So they are under a war. But probably they're it's better than what happened in Libya because the war was with Iraq and not US. No, no, I, I don't mean, don't worry, don't worry about the adversary. I mean, in the sense that, that the situation that a population finds itself in, in war. But to the other part that you mentioned, I mean, it's a, uh, whether it's, I would say it's not worse than war or better than war, it is war. But it is a war that we basically can deny because we're not fighting it with bullets. But 
in many ways it is war because if you went back to Charles Tilley's argument that what you know states wars make states and states makes war what i'm actually saying is that you know sanctions are making iran in the way in which a war would have made iran right it's changing its institu institutional map it's make it's changing its economic relationships etc uh, but there is a social side to it that you know well i would um, answer this question in two ways on the south african page we also have a, a country that was heavily involved in the capitalist market of the Western world. And so that is a different kind of sanctioning than one in which, for example, a country like Iran that has been sanctioned for so many decades, whereby more sanctions are actually not doing anything because it's already, it's already been pushed out of that kind of market. This is also goes back to the, the BDS argument when it comes to uh, Israel and Palestine. The other part of it is that you have a social component and movement component to countries like South Africa and BDS when it comes to Israel and Palestine that you do not have when it comes to Iran, right? The other part of this, though, is that when it comes to questions of warfare, first of all, the, the policymakers themselves utilize the language of warfare very regularly. The, um, those who are sitting in the Department of Treasury, those who have worked across uh, and building uh, a, a, and implementing sanctions in the, from the United States towards places like Iran, write about and talk about sanctions as warfare. They talk about what they are doing as being just as important as what the Department of Defense does. Um, and they very much think about how they speak the sanctions in exactly the same kind of language that folks in the military Department of Defense and Pentagon. That is also that on the receiving end, not the political and military establishment, do they also see this as a, as a form of warfare? Because as I said before, sanctions are not just about the economy, but there's a whole attendant shadow war that takes place. Um, and so there are multiple ways in which the, this becomes more. Um, there are multiple ways in which this becomes more um, uh, in which uh, experienced as warfare. Now, on as what Vadi was saying on the social realm, um, you are um, what we see is that sanctions have generational impacts in similar ways that wars have. We see cracks within the medical infrastructure in Iran. We see cracks within the university and educational infrastructures in Iran, and these are multi generational by this point, right? So, in the same ways that uh, those of us who are social scientists who study hot wars, we see the same kinds of effects when we are studying uh, economic warfare, whether it be in countries like Iran, I study it also closely in places like Cuba and Venezuela, you see the same exact kinds of long term generational impacts that are very akin to hot warfare. Um, and uh, so that's how I would answer those two questions. Um, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Could you, um, but firstly is, you know, could you just grapple with, um, with perhaps the outcome, I mean, assuming that the United States is a rational actor and that the results of its policy do not match up with the intentions of its policy, how do you grapple with that? Because the ways in which you've described Iran as a sort of permanently sanctioned state that is perpetually incentivized to maintain levels of the kind of behavior that sort of keep it in that box have become part of the American sort of geostrategic posture in the region, like an antagonistic sidelined Iran is part of and is key to the ways that the US interacts with, with Saudi and with the Emirates and this kind of coalition against Iran as it's emerging, the Abraham Accords. So, I mean, is it, how do you grapple with perhaps the possibility that the effects of sanctions are actually sort of perhaps what is intended, um, you know, if, if I'm making sense, like perhaps the outcome is not what is stated on the box, but is an outcome that's necessary and useful and regionally part of like a wider strategic uh, posture in the region for the United States that's beneficial, like perhaps Iran just needs to be this way. Uh, and then secondly, could you just talk a little bit about the, the chapter uh, or the work on gender in the book, which I think is is a really important contribution because you, you map that out really beautifully. Um, and that is sort of, again, goes against one of the sort of key American 
um, objectives when it comes to gender equality in the region and Iranian women's rights. And you know, if you could just address that briefly. I, I mean, I, I would say very quickly, I mean, you know, partly, and this goes beyond Iran. The question is, what is the purpose of imposing a particular sanction? So are you doing it to punish, like somebody does something and you just have to react? Uh, are you doing it to actually affect a, a, a major change, like bring them to the table or, 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 or change their behavior? Or are you doing it uh, for self-gratification of politicians here? In other words, you need to do something. You don't want to do anything. So you basically put a bunch of sanctions. So like, uh, Alexei Navalny dies in jail. There's nothing you can do about it. So why not put 250 Russian oligarch, you know, who knows even if they're oligarch or not, uh, uh, on there. You don't even think about whether it has any effect, et cetera. But it makes the administration look like it did something big. It was actually emphasis on quantity rather than quality of sanctions in, in that particular case. So, so, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have to parse these things out, but, but partly I would say that problem is that actually that is not even, even debated. In other words, what the objective is. There may be actors in the region that actually want Iran exactly in that element. Uh, and they might be very much their, um, say, uh, policy to per per perhaps make sure that the United States pursues a, a, a sanctions policy. But uh, ultimately, Again, this is something that has to be debated, in other words, uh, even by those who study these things. So, you know, there is a level at which you maintain Iran in a certain box, but then you, uh, now Iran has actually gone beyond that box exactly because the box became smaller or became tighter. You can now see that actually Saudi Arabia and UAE, for instance, who are advocates of containing Iran, have, have actually responded to a more dangerous Iran by actually doing more interaction and business with it. Right? In fact, UAE now may risk sanctions of its own if it keeps doing the amount of business it does with Iran. Right? So again, we're not looking at this in a sense of, um, it, it, you know, and, and I have to say, we're not saying sanctions are, sanctions are like guns or like any tool you have. It's not like absolutely good or bad. It's the way we use it that is problematic. Right? It's, 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 the way, it's the fact that it's not reversible. It's the fact that, that, that you know, there's no mechanisms for rescinding it. The fact that you're not actually gauging the effects. Like even in, with war, hot war, the Pentagon has means of actually seeing battlefield effectiveness. You know, what guns work, what strategy works, and then they learn from it and, 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 and internalize it. There's no such thing with sanctions. There's no, there's no uh, account taking for it. Uh. Uh, the gender question that you had, uh, well, actually, let me just finish off uh, what, where Vadi um, left off in relation to your question. One is that um, ev every member of the axis of resistance is under sanctions, right? This part of the reality that we're looking at in the country and within the region is also a, a, uh, a byproduct of sanctioning and increasing of sanctions across the region. Now, one can, part of what I, I sort of, uh, we don't include in the book, but it's, it's new discussions that we've been having is that sanctions are a form of, another form of American forever war, right? They, they sort of solidify a, a, a kind of conflict into perpetuate, perpetuity because, per, precisely because there's very little appetite for removing them. Um, now, this question of, of, is the purpose to sort of keep Iran in, in this way um, I would have argued that yes, up until the point in which larger and larger economies started to become come under heavy sanctions like Russia did. So when that began to happen on the heels of the Russia sanctions, China and Brazil, for example, began to uh, make deals that they were going to do trade in local currencies because they understood that the weaponization of the US dollar could now begin to impact any country around the world. And so instead of, for example, Iran for the longest time being this kind of pariah state that could just be sanctioned over and over and over again or its allies across the region, what we begin to see is that as bigger economies begin to realize that they, their own economy could be hit in these extremely heavy ways, they are now beginning to develop infrastructures to trade uh, um, to trade um, away from the U.S. dollar, and that is creating its own forms of infrastructure now that are beginning to move away from this logic that I would that I would have argued probably a few years ago. 
Um, in relation to the gender question, so you know the economic data and um, Javod's what our, our our economics um, our economists sort of co-author and the other folks that we had looking at the economic data were seeing that uh, sanctions were impacting women more than more than anyone else in society. The social scientists that we had with the Rethinking Iran initiative and their research that they were doing were finding that women were being impacted the most. Again, just like in any other kinds of warfare, it is always women that, that bear the brunt of war. Um, and especially single mothers, especially um, uh, uh, working class and, um, and those who are in um, the poorer sectors of society. So part of what I wanted to do when I was looking at this is again to bring sanctions down to a human level to show how how this is impacted in an everyday way. Um, and it's, you know, there are ways in which you have the stories that it, single mothers have to take on multiple jobs, they are around their children must much, much less than they were in the past because of this. Uh, but then you also have instances in which sanctions um, encourage an autarkic uh, economic system, right? So now that foreign goods are, are in, especially in, in fashion and in a cosmetic world, are harder to get into the country, it has also actually opened up a huge um, opportunity that women have been at the forefront of creating micro businesses in Iran, for example, in the fashion world and the art world. And so there is also this, this way in which um, the, the impacts of sanctions, again, just like we were saying, it is not always negative, but it creates its own realities that then, for example, a lot of these young women have who have opened their fashion shops or who have opened um, huge amounts of uh, pop ups for uh, food, for catering, for all of these things across the country now and are utilizing things like WhatsApp and Instagram, they don't necessarily want to now be competing against these foreign markets again, right? And so you have a different kind of institution institutionality of this. and like non-reversible as, as you say sanctions are, after the JCPOA was signed a number of years ago, Iran's oil exports rose substantially and, and there was both some sanctions that were eased and the kind of the vibe of sanctions around the world was, was sort of eased so that at least Iran could begin and did export substantially more oil. When, when the JCPOA was canceled by Trump, at least our, our part of it, the oil exports dropped to almost nothing. And uh, and then like Lucy in the football, I guess I expected when Biden came in, he pledged during the campaign, I'm going to rejoin the JCPOA right away and we're going to get, and of course, nothing happened there. Nothing happened with sanctions. Um, and, and then as you point out, they found sort of semi-permanent ways of getting around that. But why is that? Why Why is it that when the when the when the Biden administration came in, they couldn't take steps to what was so sticky, I guess, about the sanctions that they couldn't then take steps to ease and rebuild some sort of relationship with Iran again, which is what Biden said he'd, he'd try to do. So uh, even on the first part, so oil, oil, oil is the sort of easiest thing. In other words, just to say to Iran that, OK, you can sell oil. But then Iran needs to actually buy a lot of things with that oil which then is not allowed to do, right? So, so uh, in other words, okay, I, I, I sell the oil and I wanna buy this machinery, I wanna buy food, I wanna buy medicine, but then you know, that's not possible to do because there are overlapping sanctions that doesn't allow you to do that. So, I mean, it's one of the things that you ask anybody at the treasury and says that Iranians are perfectly, uh, 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 they're, they're perfectly able to buy medicine. It's not, it's not sanctions. They can buy medicine, they just can't pay for it. Right? In, a, in a way, that's, it's very sort of, there's another set of sanctions that governs that, that essentially makes the first one uh, uh, not work. Secondly, you know, these are uh, sort of, a, 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 as I said, that sanctions are law. So I give you an example. So when sanctions happened, when sanctions were lifted after 2015, uh, 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 one of the, a very big accounting firm with headquarters in Dubai said that a lot of our uh, foreign clients want to actually start doing business in Iran, and we were also interested in doing business with Iran. And we want to take advantage of this opening, and we want to do business with Iran. And um, you know, technically, all they had to do was to apply to the Treasury in order to get what is known as an OFAC license, and as a license to do business in Iran. 
So the treasury told them, yeah, you can apply for an OFAC license, but you have to apply for an OFAC license for every single trip that anybody from your firm takes to, into Iran, uh, every single trip, every single phone call, every single interaction with Iranians, right? And of course, uh, uh, and then obviously every OFAC license may take up to six months to process, right? So you might call it bureaucratic foot dragging, uh, you may call it, and, in the, and there's, a, there's, there's an issue here is that that part of its treasury has actually strong support from Congress not to cooperate with the executive branch when the executive branch actually wants to engage Iran. So the effect, if you're sitting on the other side, is that the sanctions were not lifted. So that's, that's what I said, maybe 20% of the sanctions were ultimately lifted and then they were sort of reimposed. No, Biden could have lifted it. Biden didn't want to lift it. Biden actually thought that maximum pressure is pretty good. It's working. Why would we, why would we uh, lift it? There's no pressure on you. I mean, in fact, probably these domestic people told them, there's no pressure on you to lift it and there is no benefit to you to lifting it. It's all costs to you. Are you going to stand up in front of the American people and Congress at this moment that you need to pass the tax, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the IRA and infrastructure bill, et cetera, and, and, and argue that you're going to give Iranians money that's going to fly to Beirut, like on the first plane from Iran, because that's the way the, the, the rhetoric goes. And the answer was, no, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, this, and so basically he said, just, uh, just let it be. And, and I do think it was a massive opportunity that he lost because if he had engaged Iran when you still had a different president in Iran, it, the outcome might have been, uh, might have been different. Uh, uh, but, but, that, but exactly, it goes to how easy it is to impose sanctions, how difficult it is to lift them. And so when you look at it, when you look at the long durée, Republican, Democrat, et cetera, this has now become permanent. So there are slight variations in it. But the prospect of it ever believing, uh, you know, yes, if there is a completely different Iran, but then you know we're talking about a something completely, uh, uh, you know, as that's like saying I'm going to stop the war on only when there is a completely different regime in place. Thank you. Um. So you see a bit of a shift in US strategy um, when it comes to um, Syria and Yemen and also Iran to an extent from blanket sanctions to targeted sanctions. And this is mostly done for, um, as they say, humanitarian reasons. Um, would you use, would you conflate your same arguments for the effective, the ineffectiveness of sanctions also to targeted sanctions as well? Or would you put them in completely different categories? That's a great question. So um, part of what we did after we finished this study and this book is that we've started a new series of studies at our initiative at uh, Rethinking Iran, which um, is essentially an anthropology of sanctions. So we are we have invited scholars from all over the world who work on differently sanctioned countries, some that are under, for example, human rights targeted sanctions, some that are under sectorial sanctions, so, right? So different, different kinds of um, societies, different kinds of economies uh, for different durees of time. Um, and in, in, first of all, we're finding that pretty much everything that we've discussed, we see in all of these different societies. But let me get to why it is in the targeted space. Um, so for example, South Sudan is one in which some of our colleagues are now looking at and will be publishing hopefully in the next um, year or so. But what they are seeing is that sanctions there were actually called for by civil society and by activists in order for human rights targeted sanctions to be put on to um, those who had uh, perpetuated the genocide in South Sudan. Now, how do sanctions work in a targeted sense, right? Um, is that you have exactly because of how I started out by saying that U.S. sanctions have increased by over 900% in the 21st century. So that means now all major banks, all major companies have compliance officers sitting there. And these compliance officers are, like any other good lawyers, attempting to be extremely risk averse so that they do not lose access to the U.S. market. So, and that I'm, not, I'm now just being hypothetical. Now, for example, South Sudan has targeted sanctions on Muhammad Ali for partaking in the genocide, right? Um, and for humanitarian, for human rights purposes. Now, for a company that wants to do 
trade with Sudan, all of a sudden the compliance officer in that company is sitting and saying, well, this person that, you're, that you want to do this trade with, he has someone in his company named Mohammed Ali. That person is not going to spend, or that company is not going to spend legal and political capital to go and investigate, is this the same Mohammed Ali as the one that is on the sanctions list, right? So what the scholars of South Sudan are finding is that actually in practice, in rhetoric, targeted sanctions sounds very good. In practice, they end up having the same kinds of effects as comprehensive sanctions. So this is something that we have to be really looking at very carefully. Um, and those scholars, I just want to ma make sure I mention their names, are Jok Madot Jok, who's at um, Syracuse University, who's looking at this, and Zachary Mondeser at BU. And their, um, their research is really fascinating. So part of what we're finding is that sanctions, because they are so widely used, even targeted ones in practice end up functioning just like comprehensive ones. Welly, uh, considering your work on political Islam and different religious organizations and Jamaat Islami in South and West Asia, uh, how does the imposition of sanctions on Iran uh, coincide with the conventional wisdom that theocratic regimes are not rational actors in global politics for two accounts? One, that their understanding about cost and benefit is very different from other actors in the international system. And secondly, that theocratic regimes are more inspired and motivated by bounties in the afterworld rather than this one. And I think uh, if you could comment on two of these understandings. I, I think you know those are those are sort of figments of uh, you know Western imagination. Uh, and and to Nargis's point, the part of demonization of the other side. You know, there might be regimes that are adverse. There might be good regimes, bad regimes, etc. But but. Ultimately, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're playing a game of chess, right? And uh, if you're playing a game of chess with somebody on a turban on its head, you don't begin assuming that this person is completely irrational around the chessboard and just makes a move on the chessboard, praying to God that somehow, you know, uh, this, is, this will actually checkmate you. Uh, you know, the, the Iranians are, have shown, in fact, the sanctions show that they are very clearly understand and, and, and they react to and organize around. I mean, if Iran has survived these sanctions, if it's survived maximum pressure all along, it's not because of praying or, or uh, the act of divine intervention. It's actually very clearly strategic decision making, right? And, and I have to say, uh, but people who say that, I mean, you have to also assume sanctions are assuming rationality on the other side, right? Because they basically are saying we're going to either whether targeted or blanket, we're going to do something that we expect that you, you understand this message and you react to it in a particular way, right? So, so I would put that aside. And that's what I'm saying. You know, it, 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 Iran is not understood today in terms of 1979 and the revolution as a different leader. He has a uh, you know different uh, 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 sort of set of uh, precepts. It's much more explained by by the framework of its relationship with the United States than it is in terms of ideology at the beginning. Follow up on that uh, point, but just before that, thanks. Um, just a point before uh, I'd say. I mean, I think the enforcement issue of sanctions wasn't, uh, didn't come through in the book. Uh, I mean, clearly over the last few years, Iran has massively increased its uh, revenues from the export of oil, in, even though the sanctions legally have not been removed. And the variable here is enforcement. So the Biden administration is basically not enforcing the sanctions that are in place. So um, in one sense, the book could have, I, I, I was looking to see that the book dealt with that, that aspect. That's the workaround, in a sense, the stickiness. And it's very clear, I mean, it's very clear that you can have a, you can have a very large sanctions regime and it can be just simply not enforced, as currently the US is not enforcing sanctions against Iran. Um, uh, so that's, a, that's just the issue of the enforcement. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is about what is really a very strong claim in your book that, as I understand it, you say that the purpose and motivation of the sanctions by the United States is to create an enemy. You use that phrase 
to it in, to produce an enemy, to create an enemy. I didn't see any evidence. I mean, I could you speak to that a little bit? I didn't see the evidence from the either from the politician side or the legislation side that the purpose is to create an enemy. It's obviously plausible that the purpose of sanctions is to respond to a country that sees itself as an enemy. So, I mean, I think that's the much more plausible um, empirical case. I mean, uh, you know, so so in so where was the evidence, and could you elaborate on that really very strong claim? And I'll just make one uh, one addition to this. Uh, if you could, you know, the idea of the responsibility for sanctions it speaks, I think, to this question. Um, Abbas Abdi, who is a very prominent almost, we could say, dissident politician within Iran, uh, was asked about sanctions. And he was absolutely unequivocally clear. He said, whatever the impact it is on Iranian society, the responsibility lies with the Iranian government. It doesn't respond. I mean, he was very clear about this. So I, was, I wonder what your thoughts are about that, your, your response to that. So uh, let me talk about the assertive part. I, I would say on the first one, yes, the United, yes, the United States can choose not to enforce certain sanctions, which is kind of like a partial sanctions removal. Uh, first of all, that's not the same thing as removing sanctions altogether. And secondly, the United States only did that because Iran behaved worse. In other words, the disagreement that they, they, they made, particularly in Oman, was after Iran went to 84%. Uh, an American was killed in Syria, and 12 others were injured, and Iran took a tanker in, in the Gulf as, uh, as uh, you know, basically appropriated ta an oil tanker. So the United States basically sat down and said, okay, we'll, we'll, let you, we'll turn the blind eye for you uh, uh, to, to, sell, to sell more oil. But again, you know, the question is only partial. Even if Iran sold more oil, it's not free to buy anything it wants with that oil. It still has to go through the, all of that rigmarole of getting what it needs back into the country. It's still, you know, other countries that sell it, things require that in dollars. Maybe some countries will take oil in, in exchange, uh, and those countries also need to be given by the United States a cert certain, certain reprieve. Uh, so, so in a way, it's still this idea of not implementing is, is, is within that whole sort of chess game of, 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 of uh, sanctions regime. Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, every government is responsible by its own people. But it doesn't change the fact that, that you are putting the pressure on the people of Iran to make the government of Iran live up to its responsibility. When you, at the same breath, you're saying that we believe that it is a brutal, unaccountable, unresponsive government. But we basically, which we believe doesn't care about you. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that cont continuously American leaders say these guys don't care about their own population. But yet, we're going to make you suffer. So when you look at 20% of Iran's middle class has fallen, fallen behind the poverty bill, that's the class that supposedly we claim is, is pro-American, right? When you would say that poverty, absolute poverty in Iran has gone higher, right? So yes, I, I, uh, it's very easy to say that this is the responsibility of, of the leadership in Iran to change themselves. But the onus of forcing this responsibility on, 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 on the United States, uh, on Iranian government is put on the people of Iran, whether they asked for it or not, whether they're pro-regime or anti-regime, whether they are supporters or not. So yes, maybe we don't have a choice, but we have to also accept this moral hazard. I mean, sanctions are imposed in this country on, 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 other country, uh, on other countries, be it Iran or others, without actually considering this dimension of it. We use the language of human rights in order to impose sanctions when, when actually, it's, in a way, it violates uh, human rights sanctions. So there are these kids going in the street in Iran, you know, demonstrating the answer is that we're going to put more sanctions on your very families. Right? Who's going to get impacted, in fact, by these sanctions uh, that, that they impose during the Mahsa Amini case? Right? It's not like it impacts the family of the supreme leader or it impacts the budget of the BBC or it impacts how much money they spend in, in Lebanon. It actually directly impacts the Iranian people. And we have those conversations about bombs. 
We have those conversations about napalm bombs. We have it about phosphorus bombs. We have it about bombing, uh, you know, civilian sites. We have all of these things under uh, international humanitarian law. And I'm not saying it is black and white and it's easy. But here, you know, nobody has this conversation about, you know, what gave the United States or any other country the right to tell that, you know, Iranians, any Iranian should lose two thirds of their income because they happen to be living under a horrible government. That, that's, that's, that's the issue. And again, as I said, it's the fact that it's actually not even debated. I'm not saying there's a simple answer to it. It's like any tool of coercion that, that it does come up with a moral hazard, but it's seen as completely cost-free here. And at the same time, we, we put it in our mouth, as we're imposing it, we're standing with the people of Iran. So it's kind of like a, 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 you know, rubbing salt into the wound. In the same breath, I can understand you saying, we want to sanction the people of Iran in 1981. We're appearing in the streets in the millions supporting Khomeini. Right? You would say, okay, they deserve our sanctions because they, 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 are all, are, they all hate us. They all, they all like this. But when you actually uh, uh, have a situation like 2022 and you say we're standing with these people, but we, yet we're going to punish the people, not one of the sanctions that they put on Iran and, uh, actually really impacts the government or impacts their budget or impact uh, their military budget, their nuclear budget, none of it. In fact, we turned around and allowed them to sell more oil when they went to 84%. But you've been saying it, it's not a problem with the sanctions. It's a problem with badly designed sanctions. Well, uh, that, that's a, uh, uh, we said at the beginning, we said in the talk that, look, sanctions are a tool, just like guns. It's, it's the way in which they're implemented. Right? If you cannot lift them, if, you, if there are all of these problems with the way in which they are exercised, then you're dealing with the effects. So when we say sanctions, as I said, it's like not, not talking about a scalpel or a knife. A scalpel or a knife is not good or bad per se. It's how you use it. Right? And the way that it's being used, now the sanctions regime that the United States uses uh, is, is actually deeply flawed in that sense. Right? Yeah, so this is not a, to get to your second point about the um, uh, the demonization and, and making, producing the enemy. Um, to finish out what, what Vadi was saying, this is not a policy book, right? This is a book that is meant to say, this is how, this is what research is showing us across the social sciences, across the, uh, from economists, from those who look at the history of the development of the political and social and cultural spheres of Iran under sanctions. So it's not out here to say sanctions good, sanctions bad. It's saying we need to develop language around sanctions so that we can begin to understand it and debate about it as a society. Because one of the points of sanctions is that it is extremely abstract and vague, and so we do not have a language for it. The other point of sanctions that sanctions policymakers tout as a strength of sanctions is that it is invisible. They talk about this ad nauseum. We've quoted it in the book. They say that this is a strength of sanctions, that it is an invisible form. Of, of implementing coercion on a society because it is not like dropping bombs where a photojournalist can go out and take a picture of that bomb and the, and the collateral damage that it's done. It is very specifically meant to be invisible, right? And so what we have attempted to do with this research is to begin to look at it and then to begin to give language about the everyday impacts of sanctions so that we can begin to, to talk about it as a society because the United States has increased our sanctions 900% over the past 24 years, we need to talk about it, right? And then in that talking about it, we can agree that this here, yes, there, no, this good, that bad. But at the current moment, it is so entrenched in a polarized debate out of Washington and other places that it is like they're just competing over a kicking of a football rather than actually looking at it in a smart way. Now, in, in relationship to your question about not providing um, 
evidence for this for the argument that sanctions um, part of what sanctions do part of the essential thing that sanctions do which we argue in the book is that it produces uh, the, the targeted society as an enemy as an enemy society um, part of what we pull from in order to make that argument in the book and I actually quote quite extensively from our US policymakers themselves who have written if you if you look closer at that section um, who have said very very clearly, that uh, the Iran sanctions, in order to get uh, South Korea, Japan, and the Europeans who were trading with Iran, in order to get them to not trade with Iran, they use this terminology, which they said, quote, we have to make Iran special, but not in a good way. And they talk about how in order to make Iran special, but not in a good way, that had to be a discursive media uh, blitz that needed to happen, and that takes place over time. That is on the one hand how we discuss it in the book about how a society and a state, putting the state aside, the society has to be made an enemy in order for it to become radioactive and not special in a good way so that the trade actually doesn't happen. So that if, uh, and this is what Richard Nephew argues in his book, which we point out to as part of our evidence, uh, along with other sanctions policymakers, which is that in order to get South Korea or Japan or the Europeans to stop trading with Iran, they had to begin to say that uh, the Re Revolutionary Guard controlled much of the Iranian economy. Richard Nephew then by the end of his book says that that was a mistake that we made because it actually was not true at the time, but we made it into a reality. Number two, the other thing that we point to as, as making this claim is that, um, the, the, for example, and actually Nahid is sitting here, she was a, a part of this. Um, in the early 2000s, um, PEN America um, was, had a very difficult time to translate um, writers from Iran. Right, um, and they had to get involved in a legal case in order to be able to translate because knowledge production, and this is what some of our social scientists have worked on, knowledge production from Iran because Iran has been made into this enemy society. Knowledge production becomes something that publishers here uh, do not uh, have had a very difficult time accepting translations from writers in Iran. Scientific journals do uh, have a very difficult time or think that they might be um, um, violating sanctions if they translate and or publish research by researchers in Iran. Now they are over complying by the sanctions. Some, a lot of the sanctions um, actually do not say that, but this is again, the problem of sanctions is that because it is so vague in language that you show the same sanctions legislation, which I have done multiple times to three different lawyers, you're gonna get three different interpretations of what those sanctions allow. And there's been a lot of pressure put on the Department of Treasury and OFAC in order to make these sanctions regulations more um, as straightforward and they have not done so, right? And so part of what that ends up doing is an overcompliance at the university level right now. Uh, students have a very difficult time to do any kind of uh, even virtual interviews with Iran because the universities are afraid that that is breaking of sanctions. Um, at, so at multi, and then Iranian students who get student visas to, to study in the United States, for example, we've had multiple instances in which those, uh, especially under the maximum pressure, they will arrive here and then they will be deported right away because again, it goes back to the logics of the enemy status of the Iranian people and Iranian society that has been produced under uh, uh, what sanctions necessitates. Thank you very much for um, a great presentation. I unfortunately have not read the book because my parents were visiting a few weeks ago and they took my copy of your book with them. <laughs> um, so, and that leads, yes, my parents. Uh, they actually took your book and not my book. So I don't know what that means. Uh, so much for kinship, huh? Um, uh, but that leads me to my question and you were actually getting to it, um, uh, now I guess, but um, this is clearly a deeply uh, sensitive um, topic for many Iranians inside and outside of Iran. Uh, passions are heated on social media and elsewhere uh, around this issue. Uh, I suspect many PDFs of your book is circulating around Iran, uh, maybe even translated, maybe multiple times, translated multiple times. Um, but I Given that um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with Nagas for many years, I won't go into the exact number because that will 
that would be both above us, so we will avoid that. But I know um, when you were doing your PhD, you got sucked into many of these issues. Um, um, but I just was wondering, this, we had a little offline conversation about this, but maybe for the audience, um, I appreciate Bali's comment that you know Iran's political economy is, is, is sanctions, but also knowledge production, as you right kindly pointed out, is about uh, is is deeply affected by sanctions. So, given all this interest in this topic uh, and four very uh, well known um, scholars of Iran inside of Iran, um, if you know if you could just share with us like attempts that you've had to maybe uh, share your work uh, virtually, um, um, uh, podcast, whatever, with uh, with Iranians in, inside Iran, and what that what challenges you faced, what that could look like. Uh, and, and because that, I think, going back to the point of making these sa sanctions um, uh, real for people at a kind of individual, personal level, I think that's important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, even just a couple of years ago, we were putting on events through our initiative at SAIS, um, the Rethinking Iran Initiative, where we were um, via Zoom inviting um, journalists who were based in Iran. Uh, we were inviting scholars who were based in Iran and then very quickly got emails from uh, university council saying that uh, this probably violates sanctions. Now, again, this was one of those instances in which I uh, had to go to multiple lawyers, got multiple different um, responses of that. But it is very... So universities are very risk averse. I have been talking to some PhD students um, who are saying that their uh, university councils are not allowing them to do virtual interviews um, with anyone in Iran. Now, this, this is again, um, put, put very much an, an, an over compliance issue. But for example, going back to what Adang was saying, when I was a graduate student here at NYU, very similar thing happened, uh, but at a much higher level, which was the president's office who called our chair and said that um, your student will potentially put the entire university at risk and you have to pull her PhD program at like year four. Um, and so it necessitated getting multiple lawyers. Um, it necessitated eventually after we were able to convince the university council that this was actually an overcompliance issue. Then the university had to spend tens of thousands of dollars on outside counsel in order to be able to get those OFAC licenses. As Vadi was saying, right? The OFAC licenses take six to nine months and they take a lot of legal money. They take a lot of money. Not most universities uh, are private universities like New York University and even still most of them will not come behind their graduate students and let alone their faculty in these kinds of ways. So this is from this end, scholars and writers who are attempting and artists who are attempting to do work in Iran we had Lady Saberni Mohammadi who did um, her research for um, uh, this initiative and, and her work and um, an, another article we've worked on together that um, has come out um, where she looks at art is supposed to be exempt from the from sanctions. But actually artists, again, have to in, they have to be able to ship their work. They have to be able to ensure their work. That all falls under sanctions. So in effect, again, be, even though it is exempt, what you have in reality is a situation in which artistic circulation of work um, again, when we look at the production of knowledge, when it comes to scholars, when it comes to researchers, it falls into all of these pitfalls of sanctions. And so that in and of itself ends up uh, really isolating the uh, knowledge production of uh, 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 scholars and uh, scientists and artists and writers within the country. Um, so those are just some some sort of high level or you know very sort of um, sort of summaries of some of these different types of things. Two more questions. Um, uh, I'm just curious. Um, Hi. Um, I realize this question may be a bit beyond the scope of the book, and you already sort of touched on it with the discussion of trading and local currencies, but has there been any critical assessment of Iran's trade as part of like the economy of resistance because I have a hard time seeing like China, India, Turkey high-fiving with Iran in this magical resisting world and uh, instead just trading with Iran and continuing to trade with Israel and trading with you know supposed members outside of the economy of resistance. Um, 
So yeah, I was just wondering if you'd run into any assessment of that or any data around that. Thank you, uh, Nergas and Valid. Following on from this question a bit, uh, given that people talk a lot about now, uh, now are increasingly discussing, um, you know, de-dollarization and and uh, 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 an age after sanctions. Um, do you do you think that the institutions that sanctions have made would make sense in a post-sanctions world? So if, if there's no longer the smuggling economy that is being laundered through all of these high-rise developments and so on and so forth that Nergas you were talking about earlier. Um, uh, and it's Iran is depending on a non-dollarized trading zone that includes also non-resistance non uh, states. Do the institutions that still make sense that have emerged in this period that you're discussing? It's a bit speculative, but I'm just kind of wondering what you think about all these discussions about the uh, the kind of post-sanctions age or the post-dollar age, which may still be a long way off. But curious about your thoughts. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Good to see you, Nargis. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you could speak briefly to the way these you and your colleagues see these dynamics playing out in the cases of Russia and Venezuela, um, and if there's any if there's any differences or uh, if it's pretty much the same patterns. Thank you. The, the, the middle question. Um, you know, one way of thinking about this is that there's a lot of work being done that, uh, you know, uh, that if you looked at the way in which colonial era economic institutions were established in different countries in different ways, it still accounts for the basis of the way in which those countries, their political economies. And, you know, they, they, in other words, the, uh, yes, in some ways, they, may, maybe, they will, maybe they will adapt. Maybe they, in a post-sanctions economy, they will change. But, but certain characteristics of, of Iranian economy has now been established. Right? You know, do, uh, you know, okay, Egypt is not under sanctions, but once Egypt's, Egypt's military took over 70% of its economy, it's not going to withdraw. Even in a post-sanctions economy, the Revolutionary Guards, whatever it might be called then, et cetera, is not going to leave Iran's economy, right? I mean, th these, these sorts of things are not, you don't snap back in that sense. That's what I mean. It's sort of more like the, the way in which political economy sort of goes. On the, on the issue you raised about Turkey and the, these countries, this is, a, this is a changing picture. First of all, a lot of this, a lot of this trade is, is, is opaque. I mean, there's a lot of Iran's money and investment, et cetera, went in and out of Turkey. And at some point, one of Turkey's largest banks got sanctioned massively by, by the US for it. It still does. But also the picture has changed because now it's not just Iran, it's Iran plus Russia. And also other countries are increasingly interested in Iran as a technological innovator in sanctions busting. They all, they all assume that their, their, their future is in Iran to some extent, many of these countries. And they wanna know how Iran has done it, right? Uh, and, and how has it actually sustained its, uh, it, itself as inefficiently as it might be. But because I think that every country, even the friendliest country to the United States, m has a hedging strategy. There's a point at which you may run afoul of the US. And, and, then, or, or, uh, and, and then you need to basically uh, sort of figure out how you're going to survive if, if sanctions come. And in an ironic way, Iran is probably the sort of the, the, the pathfinder here, how, how has it managed to do things? Uh, the resistance economy refers to um, an economic structure within Iran itself, right? So it's not the same thing as the axis of resistance. Um, uh, so it, it, it pertains much more to how do you set up, or in the Iranian case, the way that they articulate it is how do you set up your economy so that you resist sanctions and you can bust through sanctions. Um, in in relationship to Rachel, your question about um, what we see in other countries, we see similar patterns um, in which sanctions 
entrench the political and military elites of the countries um, in which they heavily um, put their neck on the uh, normal people and especially the middle classes. Um, and then, um, and, and that that dynamic is one in which the longer sanctions are in place, the more that that dynamic entrenches itself. So Venezuela is actually a great example of that, unfortunately. And part of what you then see is uh, it's actually Venezuela and Cuba being these examples that have are leading to huge migration waves um, due to sanctions, which is one of the reasons we're beginning to hear some critique of sanctions on the Hill is from Congress, uh, Congress people who represent border districts who are saying that we need to reevaluate our sanctions policy when it comes to Venezuela and Cuba because it is actually uh, very much adding to uh, the, the migration at the, at the border. Um, in the Russian case, um, we see very similar things that are beginning to fold out. Um, and again, as Vadi is saying, you know, like for example, in the Cuban case, which has been under sanctions for so many decades, um, and, in, and in essence, the post post-revolutionary state is it, it will is is ceasing to exist in the way that it did under under when Fidel Castro especially was alive um, what you're seeing happen is now you are beginning to see that those at the military and political elite in Cuba are beginning to um, further capitalize their system but they are the ones making the deals on the outside so even in a post or you know even in a in a in a system in which the political calculus begins to shift, it is still the ones at the top of these industries and, um, and entities within the economies that end up being the winners, right? Um, and so that is, again, something that, as Vadi is saying, it, it embeds itself within the political economy, just like we go from colonialism to neocolonialism. We're going from sanctions economies to sort of these neo-sanctioned economies in a way. I wouldn't necessarily term it that, but Thank you so much. Really, I was both interesting and finding 